Hi, my dear Astro family. Uh, I'm here today with a special treat for you. I'm going to be speaking to Frank Clifford, who is actually seriously one of my idols when it comes to astrology. While I was in, uh, uh, while I lived in London, actually, I, I did attend uh, a couple of his uh, seminars as well. I think, you know, you guys know that I'm a very strong uh, Jupiterian person. I can be very picky when it comes to teaching. And, uh, and Frank is one of those people who I adore when it comes to lecturing and the knowledge. And today we will be speaking about uh, Jupiter a little bit. Uh, for a couple of reasons, actually, Jupiter will be making an alignment with Neptune uh, in the sign of Pisces next year. So I think uh, it's a lifetime opportunity for us to actually dive deeper when it comes to Jupiter, because the very last conjunction between those two happened in 1856. So it's never going to happen again in our life. And secondly, um, I've noticed that most of my followers must have plenty of Sagittarius traits because there were five times more view of, of uh, the Sagittarian forecast of the 2022 year than the other signs. So I guess uh, this topic will be something very good for you. And uh, lastly, I just would like to mention a couple of words about uh, Frank, who is actually the founder of London School of Astrology. I believe uh, it was founded in 2004. He's been doing astrology for 30 years. He has written uh, quite loads of books as well. He's a publisher also, and he's got tremendous amount of knowledge. So please welcome him with warm heart. And I hope uh, he's going to be able to teach us something great about Jupiter. Me too. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> thank you very much for accepting my invitation. It's, it's an honor to be having you here. Oh, well, it's great to be here. Thank you. And I shall be as polite as I can about Jupiter and not put my foot in my mouth, which can be a Jupiterian thing, of course. <laughs> so before actually we jump right onto Jupiter, um, I, I would like to ask a couple of questions. So what style of astrology do you use? Well, I probably, it's, it's been called humanistic, so I imagine that's probably what it is, really. It's, um, you know, I grew up in London visiting the CPA when it was around, the Centre for Psychological Astrology, and on my doorstep were some amazing uh, astrologers, all women, in fact, um, people like Liz Green, Melanie Reinhardt, uh, Darby Costello, Lynn Bell, all of them, and I didn't realise how lucky I was being in the heart of, of astrology or being able to just wake up one morning and go and see these amazing astrologers. So um, uh, they taught the psychological, that's always interested me, but I'm also very keen on not just what happens within, but how you can manifest your potential, your life outside. So I do a lot of forecasting work with clients. I don't do prediction as such because I'm a big fan of encouraging the client to uh, make their own choices. But I think you make your choices when you understand who you are and what you want at this time in your life. And if you can do that through astrology, it empowers you to make better choices in relationships, uh, in, in work choices, and making decisions that really reflect your heart, reflect who you are. This is so Jupiterian topic, I guess, because I do believe that Jupiter is the planet of manifestation. It only works when we actually do a little bit of a sprinkling in our life or when we grab the opportunities. Yes, sometimes it does give us things on a silver plate, but we, if we don't spot it and we don't take it, then, then just that opportunity goes by and passes by. So definitely, I kind of agree with your style. And uh, what house system do you use? Well, I started off with Placidus 30 years ago and sort of crept back to equal houses and which are different from whole sign. A lot of people think they're the same, but it uses the ascendant degree, not the ascendant sign. And I do a lot of work with the four angles. I, I've written on the midheaven, for instance, um, but I, I like it to float. The reason that I use equal houses, and I'm not here to convert anybody because people use what speaks to them, is that it gives me a midheaven and it gives me a zenith and it gives me an icy and it gives me a nadir. And I find that when transits or solar art directions go over all four of those points, they mean different things. Uh, similar to the midheaven and the zenith are uh, similar, but um, I just noticed 
um, over the years. So I use them both. I really appreciate them both. And Equal House gives you that immediately. Uh, and I find it it works for me. And I think people should use whatever speaks to them and not be afraid to, to venture and try a few house systems. I went from having my Mars Jupiter conjunction in the ninth house and moved to equal where I put it in the eighth house, which, you know, in some books would damn me, you know, it would be a scary thing to do, but I, I can see the perspective from both of them. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. I survived. <laughs> <laughs> and as we are going to be speaking about Jupiter, what's your relationship to Jupiter? So where is your Jupiter in your chart? Right. If I'm not mistaken, you are a Virgo rising, right? No, I'm a Gemini rising. I have a Virgo moon. Virgo moon, okay. Yes, yes. so um, uh, I'm Sun in Aries, but I have um, Jupiter in Aquarius. I was born in 1973, and I work with two other people from different generations of Jupiter in Aquarius. So we obviously group together. We found each other. Uh, one of my, my tutors has it um, in Aquarius the last time in 1961. And... Uh, it's um, in the ninth or the eighth, depending on the house system, and it's conjunct uh, Mars on the midheaven in my chart. So that's where they are. Yeah. I kind of find it fascinating because um, I'm guessing uh, your Jupiter is going to be conjuncting uh, my sun in the 12th house from a sinister point of view. And no wonder why I kind of like your lecturing style and then I studied things from you too. So. Jupiter as the teacher and the sun to become who you really need to become, basically the life purpose. And, and truly speaking, I think um, definitely some of your lectures inspired me to become an astrologer who I am today. So thank you. For that. No, thank you. Thank you. I think the issue with me particularly, and I really, this being in England as well, we don't do Jupiter very well sometimes. You know, we're very Saturn country and we're not very good at promoting ourselves sometimes or um, appreciating other Jupiterians. Uh, and, um, you know, it's it's one of those planets that in a good way it can be very inspiring for people. In other ways, the worst side of it, it becomes the guru. It becomes the person who then wants followers and wants people to listen to them. And my feeling is, if you're going to listen to me, go off and do your thing once you've listened to me. I don't want people following or coming back. So my Jupiter works in a way, maybe it's my Virgo moon, it helps keep my Jupiter a little bit less huge. <laughs> um, but my, my feeling has always been to, uh, to in inspire people in an Aries-like way, do your own thing discover what you want to do. Don't come to me for answers every week, every year, whatever, you know, learn from me, I'll learn from you and together we'll do what we need to do. Uh, so I'm not a guru Jupiter fan. Uh, you go to certain countries and they do that big time. You get the big gurus who speak to everybody and I, I've never been a fan of that. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's good to keep my Jupiter in check and just teach it rather than become this monster that people can be you know, <laughs> with the worst yes. of Jupiter. Yeah. Yes, I, I know what you mean. Uh, as I said, I'm a very strong Sagittarian person. And uh, I always tell my students, because I teach quite a lot, that uh, never listen to me, go and test it, be a sixth house. So I usually explain to them third house, you gather the data. I'm here to actually give you some data. Uh, 12 house as in, uh, um, you know, your intuition in a sense or the spiritual data, basically. Ninth house merged the two and the sixth house is going to be all about getting out there and then testing that knowledge, whether it works or not. So I always prompt my students to go and listen to others also because, uh, because that's what I did as well. I started with someone, I didn't like the style, I went on another person, you know, and then different approach actually opens your mind and it's going to be helping your ninth house to merge all the knowledge so that eventually you can get out there and then teach yourself, which Jupiter means, right? We, you know, we're going to have to get out there and then share our vision and knowledge with others, not just becoming an eternal student. And I was an eternal student for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, and then after I stepped on the gas pedal, no, I have to be teaching. So yeah, that's Jupiter. Yeah, I think it's a calling as well. I was very shy in my teenage years and my 20s. And I kept away from ever standing up, talking, 
using my voice in that way, it would terrify me to even ask a question in a in a large group. Or you have to introduce yourself. By the time it came to me, I was hot and sweaty and upset and anxious. And then at my Saturn return at 29, um, I got pushed into doing a lecture. And I thought if I can open my mouth and something comes out, then hey, I can do it. And but I stood there, wasn't sure whether I would be able to do it. So it was a it was a big test. But I think Jupiterians, we have different types of teachers, of course, but I think people who are strongly Jupiterian in their way really want to go out and spread the good news, want to get people fired up, enthused about life. And it's the great evangelist, Jupiter and Sagittarius, of course. I remember uh, I attended one of your um, seminars, 2014, and that's where you said that um, everyone can become an astrologer. Uh, and there are going to be different types of astrologers. And I think you mentioned that a Virgo is going to be a very detail driven and then going to collect all the information before they open their mouth or a Capricorn and so forth. And, and you know, when people ask me, can I become an astrologer? Um, I had a client uh, uh, actually yesterday and someone told her that she shouldn't become an astrologer because she has got a sun and Uranus opposition. Uh, and I was like, sun and Uranus can become a genius, really. So uh, yes, maybe we push away the fact that, you know, uh, that it doesn't become easy to download the information sometimes, but really the potential is there. So what I hate about you know, uh, like the squares and oppositions and the net, uh, in conjunctions that are, it's all so hard. It's just all about the approach we have to life. And that's where Jupiter can actually help us because it shows in our natal chart where we can create kind of like an abundance for us or where we have got some type of blessings. But anyway, I don't want to take away... Uh, uh, your speech. So what do you have got to share for us in regards to Jupiter? Oh, with Jupiter? Well, I, I love the word blessing because we often think of Mercury as your mental talent, what you're interested in, what you like to read about, what you talk about. And we think of Venus in terms of money sometimes, although really Venus is about money for pleasure and leisure. Uh, but Jupiter is the great blessing. And I always think that you've got to share your Jupiter. You've got to be generous with it. So discover what it is that you want to share. Not everybody's a teacher, but we're all teachers in small ways, in terms of sometimes mentoring people, supporting people, um, just extra bits of kindness and whatever it may be. You know, there's a, a teacher in all of us, but we don't necessarily all do it for a living. Um, I would say, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting what you mentioned about your, your client yesterday. I was, I do some lectures for, for Turkey and I had a student come to see me and she said that in um, joining a school in Turkey, she was asked to submit her birth chart, her horoscope, and they would decide whether she could be an astrologer or not from it. And she wanted to know whether we did that at the LSA. And I, I scratched my head and thought, and the rest of the students who were there, and she was just visiting, couldn't believe they heard such a thing because, you know, astrology is full of many different types of people with many different horoscopes, with different interests, um, uh, goals as well. Some people just love to read about people and understand their friends and understand themselves. Other people want to use it in their practice. So I was amazed at that. And I'm a son Uranus opposition as well. So the idea of somebody had told me that I probably said, you know, screw you because Sun Yuana says that a lot to everybody, you know, <laughs> screw me, screw you. And um, so, yeah, that's um, probably a good way of actually talking to a Uranian person is to say, you can't do it, or you're not allowed to do it, and then they'll do it. Um, but anyway, back to Jupiter, I would say it's the great big blessing, because it's something that you're blessed with, um, uh, a sort of enormous amount of it. Uh, whether it's luck, whether it's talent, whether it's just a, a generosity, and you've got to share it, otherwise it just probably shrivels up or it ends up working in negative ways. And what we see, Jupiter is where we have um, something given to us for nothing sometimes, but it's also where we may have confidence in an area of our lives or where people have confidence in us. The problem is the birth chart doesn't 
talk about morality. It doesn't say whether you're somebody that will use that chart in constructive ways, whether you'll rob people. I had a client a year or so ago that she'd just stolen a whole load of money from people and she wanted to know whether the police were going to catch her. I'm sitting there thinking, you know, who am I attracting into my room? <laughs> um, so there's no judgment from the chart. It's a moment of time. We share it with birds and animals and contract signings and newspaper articles, all different things born at the same moment. So my feeling with it is um, what you do with your chart, how you work with your energy, it's very much up to you on a day-to-day -day level. It depends a lot on the people that you're brought up with. You may be a Jupiterian, but your family is full of Saturn or they're full of fear. They're full of um, don't, don't show us up. Don't worry, you know, worry about the neighbors. Be careful what you do for the community. And the Jupiterian person is going to see that and want to shout from the rooftops, hey, I'm here, I want to do my own thing. I'm here to, to tell a different story. Uh, so we're often, one of the things that I've, I've learned about astrology is that we're born into a situation that makes us become more of who we were born to be. So if you're a Jupiterian, for instance, uh, you might be born in a situation where people are fearful. They do say, um, don't speak up, don't go searching for things, just stick with what you know, you know, follow the family line, just do the job that everybody else does, don't stick out, you know. Same with people that are strongly Uranian, they're going to meet Saturn types, maybe the worst of Saturn sometimes, that fear that controls you, that, that worry about what other people think. And so I think people who've got strong Jupiters or strong Uranuses are born into situations like that that make them say, hang on a minute, the world is a much bigger place and, and my worldview is bigger than this narrow view of the people around me. Uh, so one of the things, I guess, to answer your question about it is that um, uh, understanding your Jupiter, understanding your whole chart, opens up the possibility to grow and develop and, and understand the journey that you're on, understand that life isn't simply about eating, sleeping, working, retiring, and then dying. You know, nobody sits on their deathbed wishing they spent more time at work unless that work was truly fulfilling, unless that work was truly something that gave them meaning. You know, I want to have decades ahead of me. I'm 40, what am I, 48 at the moment. I'm going to, I want to have decades to, and I want my mind to be sharp enough to be learning from the next generations and think, oh my goodness, I want to see the next um, you know, Saturn-Pluto conjunction. I want to, you know, that, that type of thing. I want to keep learning. <clears throat> and that's the, I think, the gift of somebody with, um, who recognizes or who's tapped into their Jupiter is the fact that I don't want um, to have a narrow, small life. I want to keep going. I want to have enough time to live many lives in one as well. It's very interesting that you say uh, you said about uh, you know what situation you were born into because that's exactly what the case was. So um, I um, I didn't know what I wanted to become when I was uh, age fourteen, and uh, my grandparents told me, "Oh, you should become a chef. You should become a carpenter because those are always going to give you very good money." Now my family line is very Virgo uh, type of energy, so. Um, especially my grandma, she had a stellium in Virgo, and then she really wanted me to pursue my, you know, to, to do well, to earn good money because I came from a poor family. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I, I'm, I'm just not good at it. So I'm going to do some IT. Uh, but then I realized within six months, IT wasn't really my cup of tea. Um, I didn't even know how to put a disc into the computer. That's how kind of like handicapped I was. And then uh, I wanted to change schools. And then I realized that I wanted to study languages and psychology. And she said, no, you started something, you must finish it. Uh, but I fell in love with English language and I really wanted to pursue that, that, uh, that direction and also psychology. And I didn't know how to bring the two together, but somehow I'm gonna do that. And, and I wasn't allowed. But anyway, I did that once I turned 18, I finished the school and then I started something else. So the family lineage, definitely. And I, and interestingly enough, um, 
my descendant is uh, Virgo, which I tend to call as the, um, the unintegrated part of your personality. So something which you kind of push away from you. And, uh, and that, was really, that is really my family line. Now, personally, Jupiter, I've got it in the 10th house. And from a blessing point of view, you know, people always call me for work. Like I left my corporate job three years ago and then uh, they called me uh, a few times this year. Do you want to come back to work for us? You know, and I was like, well, unless you can give me as much money as, you know, as logic gives me, then I consider it, was, which was a joke anyway. I wouldn't because this is my calling. But yes, Jupiter gave me the opportunity to go back if I wanted to. And then I know I've got some where to go back to if, if you know, something happens. Yeah, I think it's important to to be realistic about astrology. It takes time, <clears throat> takes time to understand the subject, to learn it, to feel comfortable and confident with it. But I was reading an article the other day from an astrologer that I respect, and he said, be prepared to be poor. And I thought, what sort of mindset is that? That's not a Jupiterian mindset where there is abundance. You know, there's enough to go around. I'm not envious of somebody else because I can have that too without them being diminished or without me having to steal anything from anybody. So I was amazed at that because there is a poverty mentality with astrology. Um, in reality, of course, if you've got a job and you're learning astrology, it's going to take some years sometimes to be able to move to a position where you can still pay the mortgage to, to look after, to take care of business. But the idea that being an astrologer means uh, you have to be poor for the rest of your life or things don't come around, that's a, that's a script. That's something in the head. It's not talking about the possibility not speaking from a Jupiterian point of view either. Um, and you see the people that have succeeded, they've succeeded with their squares and their oppositions in their chart. They've succeeded with anything that feels like a challenge. It's the easy things in your chart, like the trines that bring you stuff, but you get a bit lazy with them, don't you? You know, you look at them and you think, oh, okay, I'll take that next week. I won't bother with that. And yet it's the squares and the oppositions and those difficult aspects that bring in challenges and if we take them like me standing at my Saturn return and other aspects thinking if I can speak I'll speak and I'll become a speaker <laughs> and then you know no one can shut me up now but it's one of those um one of those interesting moments where you can look at anybody's chart and they've succeeded because they've dared they've had courage they've had some sort of vision and if you start off with a narrow way of looking at life you're going to have narrow results May I ask, there is something, there is a terminology I use, I kind of in, invented it, and I call it as fake trines and fake squares. And the idea behind it is that, let's say you've got, in my, in my natal chart, I've got a Jupiter and Venus square. Um, Jupiter is in Sagittarius, uh, Venus is in Pisces. Now, I call it as a fake square, because uh, uh, Venus adores Jupiter. So meaning that if I adore someone, why would I cause complications to the other planet? So I tend to be looking at with the aspects, the essential dignities, how, uh, how they are collaborating to each other to determine whether it's really a challenging aspect or not. So to give you an example, let's say we've got a square between Sun and Saturn, they are natural enemies anyway, but uh, if uh, let's say the Sun puts Saturn into exaltation, for instance, then that really is, you know, for me, that's not the hardest aspect, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, so no, did I, you experience um, something like that uh, in your work? I, I don't use that approach. Uh, because I think any aspect has a spectrum of possibility. So I'm not looking for thinking, oh, this is going to be easier because your Venus is in Jupiter sign already. You know, the Venus square Jupiter, for instance. I can understand that. And I've been to many lectures, um, traditional classical lectures where they've shown me that. Um, <clears throat> but my feeling with that anyway is the square just brings you um, challenges and opportunities. And if you 
have good relationships with both planets, you'll make those work. If you're fearful of finding your voice, Mercury, and you have a Mercury square, it will always be an opportunity to keep shut up, you know, to keep uh, quiet about things. Um, if you have courage and, and look at your Mercury, if you look at finding your voice, any square, any transit is just going to be an opportunity to put some energy into that. So I think of the aspects as energy. You can look at, is that a better energy or worse energy? My feeling is it's just an energy. Here it is. What do you want to do with it? Let's describe it. Let's work with it. So I don't go into that detail of um, uh, fake squares or trines. Um, but my my feeling is to, to try to describe what the potential is there and the potential issues, good and bad. Um, and if you can do that, people will recognize them and you'll get an idea of what they're using, what they're doing at that particular time. But yeah, I, I have seen that and heard of it, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that Jupiter is all about blessings and the confidence in our charts. Obviously, that's more to do with the positive side of Jupiter. So what would you say the, the, the negative sides of well, the, the interesting, giant? Yeah, the interesting thing about Jupiter, and again, this is a choice. Yeah, um, You can just go on Netflix and look at a whole bunch of videos about uh, religious gurus, who end up using and abusing people. Um, where we have Jupiter is where people have confidence in us and we have to keep um, our integrity with Jupiter. Because for example, I have Jupiter in the eighth house in the equal system. And what I found when I was starting to run the school uh, all those years ago is that people accidentally gave me more money and they'd, they'd hand me more money and I would always hand it back and I'd count it in front of them. I'd hand it back and say, you've given me 20 pounds more. The course is only this price, whatever it was. And I realized that with Jupiter in the eighth, um, I, um, I have benefited greatly from people, students, friends, people who have left me their books when they've died. We then fundraise with it. I get a lot of gifts from astrologers that we then use to raise money for the students in the school to go to conferences and different places. So we, we do a lot of fundraising. And I feel like if I use that Jupiter to just squirrel it away and keep every time somebody gave me more uh, than they should, or we're doing a fundraiser, but I'm secretly keeping the money, that's where people's confidence in you, which can be great with Jupiter, can turn sour. So when you look at people who have taken advantage of people, stolen their money, said, I will promise you this and we'll do this. And then they've run off with the money. They're, they're Jupiterian people too. And they're using that. I would say Jupiter is the con artist, the confidence trickster, because people invest in you. And then it's your decision whether you, you know, you, you commit to what you've offered or whether you run away with it. So I, I think every Jupiter placement has an opportunity to accept people's confidence and gifts and give back generously or to just do the negative and accept them and run with them. And so you often see Jupiter in the charts of people who have taken extraordinary measures to swindle people, to steal their money, to, um, to, to do some sort of big con job. Um, you also see Jupiter in the charts of people who are, have been elevated um, beyond their talent massively. Uh, you know, the diva is the Jupiter as well, where everybody is, you know, um, she's, she has to have the, the new, she has to have the room painted pink before she enters. She has to be holding puppies and champagne and the whole rider that people have. And um, that's the over the top nature of Jupiter, where you become spoiled, you become overconfident, or you become um, uh, entitled in a very narcissistic way. And we do live in a society or we live in a bunch of societies that have a tremendous amount of entitlement from different people for different reasons. And that's often Jupiter talking too. So the con artist, the diva, um, the swindler, these are the negative sides where people have invested in a Jupiterian and that person has um, either run off with the money or abused somebody's trust. 
they've um, become a confidence trickster. They've abused other people's confidence in them. Do you think that the recent um, Saturn-Jupiter conjunction uh, also mm -hmm. was a reminder for us not to become a con artist, for instance? Um, I hope so. I think that Jupiter-Saturn back um, in, Jan in December, uh, a year ago, 2020, um, it was in the sign of Aquarius, at the very beginning of Aquarius. And I was saying at the time, I think astrologers need to be super professional in the coming years, because <clears throat> astrology is already a subject um, that has got, you know, hundreds of years uh, of um, observation. Uh, it was integrated, of course, with science and medicine many years ago. And now in England, for example, you can't go on television or be interviewed seriously without them having a disclaimer for entertainment purposes only. And I was saying to the group of astrologers that I spoke to about a year ago, just at the time of the conjunction, I said, we have to be super disciplined. We have to be very professional in how we go about our practice, what we say to people that we don't make ridiculous predictions, that we don't um, in some way abuse the trust. Um, because I think the Jupiter and Saturn together is going to be very testing for astrologers. And I think of that because Jupiter is the planet, one of the planets of astrologers, and Aquarius has that feeling of doing, you know, odd things or being on the on the periphery. And I think astrologers would would probably recognize Aquarius as being the sign, in a sense, of astrology when it's out there, different, not on the syllabus. So my feeling, yeah, I guess my answer to that is um, uh, it's not about being a con artist. I think it's about just being extra vigilant about how you present yourself uh, professionally to people. Because 20 years from now, the next Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, astrology in some countries might be banned. It might be that the licenses are taken away in America, people who practice. It might be something that we have to um, almost apply for. So we have to be very mindful of our professionalism, I think, over this next period. Jupiter is also connected to the higher mind. So why do you think Jupiter represents our higher mind? Well, if we're thinking of third house Mercury being the day-to-day -day mind, um, although the moon has a lot to do with that too, um, I think the higher mind in the sense that um, it's always thinking beyond. You know, I always say each sign comes out with a certain word. When they come out of the womb, um, Aries says, me, 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 and Taurus says, no, and Gemini says, why? And they're always asking questions. Sagittarius is, why not? Let's give it a go, you know? Sagittarius is a sign of the smile and the friendliness and the, and the sense of, okay, let's, let's, let's try it. Anything's possible. And so Jupiter Sagittarius has that um, sense of what is possible? We don't know yet. Let's discover so in the sense of the higher mind, simply looking at higher principles in the mind, going further, it has that quality. Mercury is always local. How can I ring you, connect, get the information, plug in the computer or plug in the disk? <laughs> um, and Jupiter is always, how can I connect what I'm hearing with something greater, the greater meaning? So maybe that has the link to the higher mind in the sense. I think Uranus has a link to the to the higher mind. I think all the all the planets, particularly the social and outer planets, have some sort of connection to something beyond the day-to-day -day inner planet experience of the moon and Mercury. I agree with Uranus also representing the higher mind because that's the higher octave of Mercury as well, right? So somehow it connects to the downloadable information from the skies as the god of sky, Uranus. Um, and I just wanted to um, refer to the fact that you said that with Jupiter, you know, we should not become greedy because at the end of the day, it does rule Pisces also, which is all about compassionate love. It has got the giving and given nature, but I usually um, tend to say that we do need to be careful with the Piscean side of Jupiter because it either becomes the savior or it becomes the, uh, the person to be saved. 
Yeah. So the, the kind of like the drama triangle, and then it becomes a vicious circle. So um, one of my best friends usually tells me, um, she was just recently in hospital, unfortunately. And, um, and she says to me that, oh my days, Victor, you are so optimistic and I adore that within you. And of course, with all the Jupiterian traits, I am a very optimistic person. And, but maybe the negative side sometimes is that a very strong Jupiterian person might feel invincible in a sense. And obviously when there is a dangerous situation, then um, it depends how you're gonna be acting on that. Uh, drama. Yes, and Jupiter goes out looking and expecting fortune and lucky breaks, and they get that, of course, and if you expect it, you tend to get it. Yes, there can be that inflation of feeling like you're untouchable, and that's where the confidence trickster gets their confidence. No one's going to catch me. Um, the other thing that I link to Jupiter is depression, and we often think of Saturn as depression because it's cold, hard reality. But when you pe see people with strong Jupiter, strong Sagittarius particularly, um, you often find that they're disappointed in life. They've expected big things and the rest of the world, they, they run it, rush into the world saying, I'm giving 100%, it's going to be fantastic. The rest of the world goes, okay, I'll give you 23% if you're lucky on your return. You know, And so I think Often you find, particularly with Sagittarius, Sun, Moon, Ascendant, um, uh, there's a, a disillusionment, a disappointment in life that it hasn't delivered what they expected or what they wanted, and that can be a um, that can be a, a downside. I've seen uh, when I was doing charts at that um, college and then university um, thirty years ago, I was always surprised to see Sagittarius with the most depressed people I was studying with. And it wasn't because their chart was wrong, <laughs> that they were secretly Capricorn. Um, I, I thought, well, this is fascinating. And it turned out because they were just, they thought there was more to it. And I realized, I say to Jupiterians now, people with strong Sagittarius as well, don't go in expecting other people to be as enthusiastic, as fired up, as committed to discovering something as you. Enjoy the process, the journey. Don't worry about the arrival or other people's response. Enjoy the moment, enjoy the discovery. If other people don't get switched on, fired up, then you don't have to, don't have to do that. You don't have to be disappointed either if they don't get turned on. Um, that, I think that's part of the issue, to do it for yourself. And it's contagious. Other people will look at you and think, I wanna do that too. But if you're waiting for some feedback from people, you're going to get disappointed because a lot of people are not ready to embrace a better life for themselves. They don't want to change. They want to moan and sit there about and moan about life instead of take action and have courage to change their life. And so the Jupiterian can get despondent if other people aren't as invested or as excited. So I say stay clear of that and just do it for yourself. And if people, if you find people are inspired along the way, fantastic, but don't rely on other people's, um, don't expect other people to be uh, super committed. And then you won't be as disappointed or disillusioned. Yeah. Very interesting. I never approached Jupiter from a depression point of view, and I definitely understand where you're coming from. However, I, I tend to associate depression, not with Saturn actually, but more uh, with Mars. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons is because most of the symptoms of uh, depression is very Mars related, yeah. such as, you know, like uh, kind of feeling empty or uh, because typically there is no motivation there or sleep disturbance, uh, because obviously the mind is very restless. But I, I, I get where you're coming from. Interesting approach, definitely. Um, thank God I don't think um, I'm a depressive person. Hopefully I'm not. I don't now, think everybody, uh, you know, not, not every Jupiterian is, of course. But it, if you're investing in other people and they're not coming up, it's going to be disappointing. But you're absolutely right about Mars. It's the um, when you've got no goals, when you've got nothing to strive for, to wake up for, that's depressing. 
You know, if you sit around all day doing nothing and haven't achieved something, that can also be depressing. So that lack of energy with Mars can be turned around and be, you know, it can be anger, it can be frustration, it can be depression, certainly. There are different types of depression as well, of course. Yeah, yeah true. Do you use uh, planetary joys? Because no. uh, Jupiter loves being in the 11th house the most, according to Asian astrology. So do you see some rationale in that, Jupiter loving uh, to spend time in the 11th? Um, yes, but you know, I, I think you could put Jupiter anywhere and it could enjoy itself. You know, um, that's my feeling. You know, yes, I understand the link between the ninth and the twelfth, ruling the ninth and the twelfth signs, and and I've I've heard the rationale of the eleventh house. But I, yeah, to me that that's always interesting. That's a nice way to start a conversation. Sometimes, if it's helpful, it can be limiting in a way that it. Uh, it simply says that's the best place it can be. Certain planets should be nocturnal, some should be, uh, oh, you know, that, that whole um, day night issue is fascinating. And it comes from a past where they were really observing the sky and we can learn a lot from the classical astrologers of, of the time. Um, but if it blocks, if a reading about having a retrograde Mercury or a, a, um, Venus in detriment blocks somebody and it doesn't offer helpful advice. Not like, well, you won't have any money, but at least you'll have this. That's not very helpful either. But, um, you know, my, my feeling always is if you can't say something constructive and something helpful and meaningful to somebody, leave it alone. Don't bring your prejudices in. And so when I read a lot of the traditional stuff, I'm wary because it's sometimes in the hands of people uh, that I've read, I've seen um, in person uh, lecture, it's, it's um, with a, a condemning tone or it's without the experience of actually seeing clients. And a lot of astrologers are theoretical. They're all up here with their ideas of mixing and matching things without actually ever doing readings for people. And that's what frustrates me. That, that, that drives me crazy. I saw a, a a lecture from an astrologer a few years ago. I'll tell you later who it was um, <laughs> off camera. Um, and he um, uh, hadn't, didn't have much experience with clients, but he was well known as a uh, traditional translator and reader and was saying how he had put this client off from being a singer because her chart didn't show eminence in singing. And I sat there and I thought, well, what about the fact that she just loves to sing? Don't put anybody off what they love to do. You know, if we can't, even if we can't see it in the chart, it doesn't mean she couldn't be a singer. Nowadays, anybody can be a singer and you don't look at their chart and think, what a great singer. You just think, wow, somebody discovered you and you've got nice, you've got a nice body and you can shake it on a video, you know? Um, so when he put her off that, I thought that's precisely what you shouldn't be doing. There was an opportunity in, with that client to hear what she truly loved to do, what made her feel alive. And instead of saying, mm, the chart doesn't support that, I would have said, how do you want to do it? And if she said, I want to be a pop star, well, you know, not many people become pop stars. But I, what about working in the local bars? What about training? What about joining a choir? There are lots of things we can do as astrologers that are really um, helpful and really listening to what the client loves and what they want to do. And I find sometimes categories or judging the planet ends up as a heavy judgment on the client. And instead, astrology should be opening in a Jupiterian way, opening a world of, of possibility to the person. Uh, because as I often say nowadays, you know, 80 something percent, 88 percent of the world or something, is on the poverty line. They don't have the luxury of watching Astro Victor. They don't, they don't have the luxury of knowing astrology. They just got to survive and they've got to. So the fact that maybe 10 to 12% of the world have access to information about the life being more meaningful as we get that through astrology is a, um, is a remarkable thing. And it's not a gift that we should be throwing away. So if people come and see us, 
make the most of that. Do whatever you can to get these people following their bliss, to really love what they're doing. I completely agree. I recently made a webinar about whether planets in detriment or fall are really bad or not, because I can read, I mean, I, I can see plenty of uh, concerns and worries coming from people on Facebook groups and stuff like that, that all oh, my days I'm doomed because my Jupiter is in the sign of Capricorn. Um, and one thing I mentioned in regards to Jupiter in Capricorn uh, in that class was that, uh, yes, Jupiter is about quantity, but Capricorn is about quality. So actually one of the positive manifestation of that Jupiter in the sign of Capricorn is that maybe we can actually produce a lot more quality work. Or um, if we um, take the traditional astrology and Saturn is a little bit of a depressive, melancholic sign, then actually Jupiter helps uh, in Capricorn to get out of that depression. So it can kind of like give in a little bit of a flame or an uplifting energy, or it gives hope to that Capricorn. And, but from, an, uh, from uh, the negative side of Jupiter, uh, which can indicate greediness, uh, in Capricorn, actually, it's going to be less, less, it's not going to be greedy, or uh, it's going to be a little bit more moderate when it comes to, let's say, spending money or, or you know, like you mentioned that uh, um, at the end of the day, Jupiter needs to share something with others. And it's not just about take, but give as well. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with you. I don't see planets uh, being doomed in uh in, in detriment and fall position. But how do you see, um, what are the positive signs, for instance, of Jupiter in Virgo? Um, because obviously that's, again, a weak position of Jupiter. Yes, allegedly weak. I, you know, if, if Jupiter is your great talent, Jupiter in Virgo has the talent to research, to investigate. Um, I think Virgo has a lot in common with Scorpio. Scorpio emotionally investigates. Virgo investigates and gets everything in order. So Jupiter in Virgo is the invitation to take your skill and to really master it. And it may be a skill in inspiring people in a Jupiterian way, but it has a intellectual research Virgo type of feeling to it. You know, I think the only, you know, when, when astrology was being practiced hundreds of years ago, it was being practiced for the monarch or it was being practiced for horary answering questions or electional, electing for the king to start launching the armada or the, you know, for the, for the war or what, when to start something. And so the astrologers needed to be very clear about things. So, you, you know, you launch it when the planet is at its very best. Uh, and this is what we do as electional astrologers. Um, when people have birth charts, they have a whole lifetime to express those qualities. So the idea that a planet it rules a particular sign, it just means that they resonate with each other. They have similar themes. And if a planet doesn't um, have a similar theme, like Jupiter, uh, which is the planet of largesse, and Virgo is all about the planet of smallness and uh, of the sign of detail, uh, the sign of smallness and detail. Um, when you get the big planet in the small sign, um, it's not speaking the same language. It's just got a very different job to do. And I think our job as astrologers is, is to try and help people work out what that job is, uh, rather than simply saying, ah, your Jupiter doesn't work very well. And that means you won't be a teacher, you won't be famous, you won't be whatever, whatever goes on in, in the astrologer's head. Uh, so I think it's, um, you see a lot of people with so-called great positions that do little, with that placement. And you see some pretty remarkable people who do a remarkable amount in their lives with a so-called retrograde, detrimented, fall, debilitated position for some reason. And the more charts you read, the more you realize that people do exceptional things with so-called difficult placements or a lack of something. Um, and it comes down to, awareness, it comes down to drive, it comes down to opportunity. Uh, and, you know, my dad used to say, we're lucky if we, we're born with a, a full battery. You know, we're lucky if we have our health to give us 
strength to keep going because a lot of people haven't got that and that's their battle so um i and i also say that people are born with birth charts that are um you know people are bigger than their birth charts the birth chart is a remarkable tool to reflect your energies your drives your motivations what you signed up to do but people do things beyond their birth charts or they get involved in things that are, are different or they spend all their lives in one corner of their chart instead of others. We never know what people are doing with their charts either. So we can't tell that simply just from looking at the chart. It could have been a child that was that died of polio at five years old and we're looking at the chart thinking they have great potential and they didn't have the chance to do that. Um, I don't think you can see everything in the chart. That's what I'm saying. You can't see why somebody is a murderer from a chart. You can't see that they died early. I've never seen any convincing evidence in astrology that shows that. Never mm -hmm. seen that uh, in 32 years. Never seen anybody show me something so convincing. I think, ah, oh, we can tell that. We can tell when somebody's going to die. Or we can tell that that's why they killed and their twin brother didn't. Um, nobody shows that because astrology doesn't describe it. It describes the seed, the, the energy, and what we choose to do with that is our choice, but also everybody around us, as I said at the beginning. They, they sometimes push down our urges. They encourage them. If we've got a, a father that's got no respect for the law, that's going to be our guide. And we'll use our chart in a way that has no respect for other people or the law, etc. So that's my general philosophy on it. I, I think astrology is remarkable, but I don't think it has all the answers. And people looking for that are going to be disappointed. Um, but if, if you look for the right thing in astrology, and that is to be inspired to understand who you are and what you're born to be, that's the most empowering thing in the world. Yes, completely. And, you know, um, when I teach uh, astrology to students, I, I, I tell them that I think the natal chart is kind of like the, uh, the, the first seven years of our life, what we really learn from our parents, like the rising sign, what you are told to become in a sense. And that's, 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 what, that's the reason why we call the rising sign as the Mars, because that Mars gets put on our face. But um, maybe Jupiter can actually help us to see the bigger picture and uh, where we, we can become more knowledgeable. And, and if, we, if we do so, then, um, then I think it, it really is about potentials. So to give you an example on that, as I mentioned, I was told to become a chef or a carpenter, but um, I knew I wanted to become a teacher. So I've got a Pisces rising sign and then I was always told that you need to save uh, people around you, you need to help, uh, you need to be compassionate about the fact that, you know, you have got life and, uh, yeah, your parents threw you away, but uh, there is someone else to raise you and you need to appreciate all the little things. And, um, but as soon as uh, when I first traveled, Jupiter as in the planet of traveling, uh, the horizon really opened up to me. And then the first trip I, I took was to London and then I did it in an Aquarius way. Uh, one day I had a love drama, then I packed the bags on the same day and then I traveled to London the next day. So very Aquarian style. I wouldn't ever do that anymore, by the way. Um, at least I wait a week with the ticket, <laughs> but yeah, so... And then, you know, you, you, the horizon opens up and then you have got all these new learning experiences. And uh, if we want to learn more about Jupiter, then we really need to dig into that Jupiter by aspect, house, deck, and what, whatever we use to, to, to just gain more knowledge about that planet. And one of the things, by the way, I like about Jupiter in uh, Virgo is that it has got the can-do attitude with high standards. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why Jupiter should not be classified as such a detrimental position in Virgo, because it can really reach things. It has got the potential to become great. I've got one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, and that would be about this upcoming uh, Jupiter-Neptune uh, conjunction. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm asking that, because obviously, um, 
on one hand, it's very positive, but on the other hand, there is this um, kind of like the sheep are following, you know, like being chased by the dog and following kind of a herd type of situation I'm feeling with this Jupiter-Neptune conjunction. So I'm just wondering what's your take on that? Well, I haven't given it much thought. The upcoming one, um, I'm doing a year ahead next month. So I'm going to give it some thought in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, the last one that happened obviously was in Aquarius. Um, what was that, 14 years, um, 15 years ago, maybe? Um, uh, the Jupiter-Neptune in Aquarius. And what you get with Jupiter-Neptune is often a new trend. It can be a new musical trend or somebody that takes over the world. Last time it was Susan Boyle, the ordinary lady, Aquarius, you know, um, that sense of uh, they made a sensation of her during Jupiter Neptune. And so with Jupiter Neptune, they're both the planets of fame. Uh, I've written a lot on celebrity fame, that sort of thing over the years. And being both planets of fame, Jupiter is about the idea of wanting to be somebody big to be special, to be up there, to be elevated. And Neptune is the selling of that to every market. So if you can be sold, not just to your market of astrologers or whatever, but to the mass market, that's the Neptune experience. So on a general level, we're gonna hear something next year about somebody who is the latest craze. That's a good Neptune word, isn't it? It's yeah. gonna go viral, you know? Um, and so that's going to be one thing. We're going to hear this and it will be some sort of Pisces representative. It will be somebody that's doing something spiritual. Um, it won't be somebody like Greta Thunberg, who's very Capricorn and punishing and scowling. It's not going to have that, that type of uh, Capricorn energy that she has. Um, it will be something um, very Piscean, whoever that is ready to come up and emerge. But on a more personal level, of course, it is waking up our ability to, to dream big, to think big, um, to be, as you say, we, the Pisces energy can be sheep sometimes of just following the crowd and being, uh, you know, believing that you're being duped. You know, we've got the Neptune conspiracy theory that is always there, the idea that we're being manipulated. And maybe Jupiter, there's the idea of mass manipulation next year. So we have to be conscious. We have to be awake uh, with any time, every year, every day of the year, we have to be wake, awake. But the Jupiter Neptune says there may be some big um, belief or issue that is sold to us. Now, it may have something to do with COVID, it might not, it might be something new, um, but we need to, if we need to take a stand, let's take a stand. Let's be, let's be clear about what we feel about things, you know. Um, on a personal level, though, coming back to that, it is about getting in touch with um, doing, incorporating something into your life that has more meaning. So Jupiter is the explorer, Neptune is the connector. In, on a spiritual level. So for those people who want to learn astrology or want to learn tarot or want to do a mediumship class, next year is the great time to do it. It's about getting in touch with something that isn't all about clocking in and clocking out in a job. You know, just doing your literal job, going home and then zoning out, watching TV. It's about engaging on a uh, a more powerful spiritual level, whatever that means for you. So if anybody's got a dream that they want, even if they want to sing, if they want to be a pop star, go for that dream somehow. Do something that is engaging with that energy of faith and belief in oneself. You know, I think um, if we sit there, this is a maybe controversial sometimes to think about this or, or say it, but if we sit and pray for something, Oh, Lord, please give me that Lamborghini. Give me that whatever. We're almost denying our ability to get it ourselves. We're asking for it. When in fact, generally, if we have a belief in our ability to work and our ability to, to work for something and to envision something in our lives, we can do it. 
So um, the idea that we're praying that something, you know, the Lord or whoever it might be, please give me, give me this. Um, we're saying we can't get it ourselves. And I think next year we really need to come back to the idea that what we want in our lives, we can envision, we can strive for it. it may not be the biggest, the best, the richest. It may not be any of that, but it should be meaningful. And so if we've got a dream that we've got, that we've had for a number of years, um, let it come out next year and try to work towards it somehow actively. Don't wait, don't pray for it. Believe in yourself. Pray to yourself that you believe and can manifest it. That's my feeling. So the Jupiter, the planet of manifestation and Neptune, the planet of the big dream of something meaningful. Together, that's pretty magical. In Pisces, it makes it even more magical. Exactly. Um, before everything then moves into Aries, the next, you know, the new sign. So that final, it's almost like, what is your big gift that you've been wanting for years? Do it before it's too late, before the zodiac finishes, you know, before the end of Pisces. So that's that, that's my take on it. Just thinking. I of think it, uh, uh, you brilliantly summarized, and you've given so much wisdom, Jupiter. Uh, to people to look at, you know, what their dreams are and stuff like that. Guys, if you would like to learn from Frank, I really urge you to actually look him up because I think you have experienced just now how brilliant teacher he is. And um, he is the founder of London School of Astrology, so you can Google that, but I can also put the link in the comment box below. And uh, just one announcement, I'm going to be making a webinar on the 20th of November, and that will be about actually Mercury retrograde. I want to shatter the Mercury retrograde uh, misery because um, actually uh, Mercury retrograde, in my opinion, connects to Star of David. So therefore, every single Mercury retrograde will be talking about unlocking some of your potentials, your talent. And the reason why I say that is because you will see whenever Mercury goes uh, stationary direct, 11 months later, Mercury will be actually uh, retrograde on the very same point and degree. So for instance, 2018, uh, September 27th, on top of my head, Mercury went direct on 27 degree of Scorpio. 11 months later, it went retrograde there. And then we start actually looking at the shape of Mercury. It's going to be making a, a star of David. Just like Venus is uh, drawing the pentagram, Mercury is doing the star of David. So we will be actually exploring those uh, Mercury cycles a little bit more in depth. Frank, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Victor. It's been fun. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then thank you, guys. See you soon with another video. Bye-bye.